All right. Well, hey, once again, welcome back. So good to be with you guys. A uh, couple things. Today's a really exciting day for a myriad of reasons. Number one, as you've already seen, we get to dedicate children, and that's amazing. Uh, number two is a very exciting day in Kansas City because today, after like six months and one hour, the Chiefs are back. I don't care if it's preseason. It ain't baseball. So that's awesome. And uh, number three, the third reason why today is very exciting is due to the fact that for some of you, for the first time in six weeks, you are sitting in service without your children. So welcome back. And by that, I mean your attention. So it's like for the first time you're here and you're, you're not like listening to, Dad, can I see your phone? Dad, I gotta go to the bathroom. Dad, what does it mean to be scourged? Dad, Craig said he was going to keep the message family appropriate, and I don't think he is. And, uh, you know, the, the idea of family services is a really beautiful concept. Emphasis on the concept. <laughs> you get them all in here, and it's great for one week, and then you realize, like, Lord, thank you for crew that serve in our family ministries. In fact, can we just put our hands together and thank the crew that serve back there because they do a phenomenal job. Nursery, through youth, kids check in, all of you are wonderful human beings. Uh, thank you. Today is awesome because we get to open up our venue and I just want to thank a couple different people specifically. I want to thank all of you that gave sacrificially towards that I can't remember the exact number. I think it was over $30,000 that was given to make that project happen. So like kids' lives are being impacted right now as we speak in there because you gave. Our youth ministry has a home on Wednesday nights because you gave. We were able to bless the socks off the, our Hispanic uh, friends that meet there in the afternoons because you gave. Our city house partners, the list goes on and on. Thank you for giving. Specifically, I want to thank Bill uh, Amsbaugh, who uh, just kind of stepped in as our general contractor, saved the day. And uh, specifically, can we put our hands together for our own Ward Wasmer, who hates uh, praise from the stage, which is why I love to give it even more. Did all of our technical AVL, all the stuff that makes no sense to me or most of us just made a great space for our kids. And so I'm really, really grateful for those guys. Uh, today, we are in week number two of a four-week series called Persona Non Grata. And if you're unfamiliar with that phrase, it means simply it's like an unwanted person or an unwelcomed person. And from that is where we derive the subtitle of our message series, The King That No One Wanted. And I want to do something a little atypical. I want to ask that our ushers would distribute the elements for communion now. And so if we're going to have a little bit of a distraction, I'd rather have it on the front end when I'm kind of summarizing, because we're going to end service just a little bit differently today. And so last week we ended on this thought that the cross shows us that Jesus was willing to literally give up everything for us. And we really hammered home this idea that he would, he who was once rich spiritually, would leave the perfection and the holiness and the, 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 the perfection of, of heaven, the greatness of heaven, and he would come down to earth and he would take on our flesh, our brokenness, our sin, and he would enter into our poverty because it would be only through his poverty that we could become spiritually rich. And that in the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as a self-made man or self-made woman. That there's no new money in the kingdom of God. We're all old money. That we're rich, but we're not rich because we got rich. We're rich because we received an inheritance. Our riches are only through Christ. And it's a massive, massive thought. And that leads us to today. And today, guys, is theologically monumental. Today is a big one. And it's wild to think that after this two and a half year journey 
of just chipping away through the gospel of John, starting all the way back. How many of you remember the prologue, our origin story series? That in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And from there we moved into John the Baptist. You remember him? That honey eating, camel haired vest wearing hippie who would be the forerunner. He would be the one that, that would proclaim that one greater than he who would come. And then for the next two years, we have spent two years of our lives examining, being convicted by, looking at the teachings, the miracles, the parables, the tensions, and ultimately the life of Jesus. And after two and a half years today, Jesus Christ will die. And that's where I want to pick up in our text this morning. And so for those of you who remember last week where we ended, the, the process of crucifixion has officially begun. He's, Jesus has been beaten severely. He's been forced to carry his cross to the place of his execution. He's been publicly shamed. Nails have been driven into his hands and his feet under the weight of his own body struggling to breathe, Jesus will look out and he will see Roman soldiers divvying up and making claims to the last of his earthly possessions. And it's there against this backdrop. We'll read together John chapter 19, starting in verse number 25. And John writes, that near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So a couple things right off the bat. The first is like so on the nose. It's so obvious and right in front of our face, I'm afraid we might miss it. And it's the fact that the author of our text, John, is writing as an eyewitness account. That John is there. To which some of you might think, well, yeah, no, no duh, Craig. Like, of course, we picked up on that. But like, is that a no duh though? Because despite what you may think, many scholars believe that of the 11 remaining disciples, John is the only one we know that was actually in attendance at the crucifixion. The only one. The other 10 disciples, like we have no reason to believe that they're there. In fact, we're leaning towards they probably bounced. And who knows why? Is it because they were afraid? Because maybe they didn't have the courage? Could it be that in that moment they didn't have the faith to show up? We don't know. But John's there. And not only that, we're told that John has company. There are four women in particular that are mentioned. And I just got to say it, isn't it interesting how when the men run off scared and afraid, the ladies show up? <gasps> That's what the Barbie movie was all about. <laughs> now it's me. Okay, I'm just kidding. But for real though, like these women showed up. They're mentioned. They were recorded in the annals of history. They were there by his side. And apparently because biblical parents didn't exercise much creativity when it came to the naming of daughters in this time, <laughs> we're told that three of the four women all have the name Mary. That's not confusing at all, is it? We have a, our monthly new thing gathering here at the church and there's one church in particular that when they come, almost every month they come, they bring all three of their pastors and I kid you not, all three of them are named Blake. <laughs> like what are the chances of that? It's not like John or Chris Blake. It works out well for me though because I can tell him it's like, man, 
you're the only church in New Thing that I know the name of every one of your staff. That's how bought I am, bought I am to you. But they're all, three of the four, named Mary. And so let's like run through like who these women really are. Okay, so the first is that we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay, check. We got that. We know her. The second lady mentioned is Mary's sister. Most likely this was a woman by the name of Salome. The third woman, the second Mary, is Mary who was um, married to this guy named Clopas. In fact, we don't know much about her. This will be the only time she's ever mentioned. And then last, but definitely not least, Mary number three is Mary Magdalene. And even though this is the very first time that we are encountering Mary in the Gospel of John, towards the very end, she will be a major player in our story. Uh, Luke chapter 8 shares the story of she has a very troubled, very dark past that Jesus would deliver her from demonic possession in her life. Jesus healed her and miraculously set her free. So she has much to owe Jesus, as do many of the other disciples, but she shows up. Verse 26. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, this was John, standing nearby, he said to her, woman, which we've talked about this before, but like, you know, this is something that gets muddled in our like nomenclature, our modern day translation. Today, if I'm like, yo, woman, like it would be like, oh, Craig is a chauvinistic jerk, right? Like it's different that there's no disrespect. Here, It was actually quite the opposite, a term of endearment. He says, woman, here is your son looking over at John. And he says to the disciple John, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. What's so amazing about this is that here we see Jesus undoubtedly writhing in pain, overwhelmed in agony. And it's like he's just, he's looking for his mom. Yesterday I watched that uh, Johnny Manziel documentary on Netflix. Any of you guys seen that? Like what a train wreck. And it was such a little insignificant detail, but it stuck out to me is that after every game, at Texas A&M, he would always look for his parents. And then after that massive Alabama upset, he couldn't find them. He was just surrounded by hordes of people. And I kind of just see Jesus, he's looking for his mom. And he finally sees her. You know, rightly so, we have put all of the emphasis on the, the torment and the pain that Jesus had experienced, both externally and spiritually, but can we take a moment and just begin to fathom what his mother is feeling in this moment? That she's been an eyewitness to everything that has happened to her son. That she's seen every strike of the cat of nine tails. She was watched as he was, his character was destroyed, falsely accused. She would have inevitably seen as Jesus would have crumbled under the weight of the patibulum and Simon would be forced to carry the cross. She would have seen the nails and she's watching her son. Can we even fathom the brokenness and the pain and the weight that this woman is carrying? And Jesus, inevitably, he sees his mother's face. And what this shows us is even though you could not fathom, you could not concoct a worse place in your mind for Jesus to be in, even there, he chooses to put the needs of others before his own. Even there, he chooses to serve his mom, who at this point is widowed and alone. I don't know about you guys, what that shows me is what a follower of Jesus Christ filled with the spirit of God is capable of doing. 
that even right now you could be in your lowest moment, that your life could be actively unraveling. And I'm here to tell you, don't believe the lie that you've got to sit on the bench and you've got to figure all your stuff out and become a, a better version of yourself and then you can make a difference. What this shows us is even in the middle of your pain, even in the middle of your brokenness, even in the middle of not having the answers, even in the middle of feeling like you have lost control of your life, you can still influence and impact someone else for the glory of God. In fact, this may be a part of your journey of healing, to take the focus off of yourself, to put it on someone else and to serve, to say that I am in need, but even in my need, I will look at you and your needs will be greater than mine. This is the beauty of the body of Christ. And Jesus would embody this radical service even up till the final gasps of his life. He had every excuse to be focused only on himself, but yet he's still there to serve and impact and to bless. It's amazing. Verse 28, later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant. Remember how I always say this, nothing in the Bible is there by accident. Why mention the hyssop plant? because it's clearly a parallel to the original Passover. When the Israelites would use hyssop and they would paint the blood over the doorpost, it's a connection to the sacrificial lamb. A hyssop plant, put it on a sponge and they would lift it up to Jesus' lips. So this drink, the, uh, the wine vinegar, we're told, not to be confused with the, the drugged wine or the sour wine, which Jesus in other gospels would reject to numb out his emotions. This wine, on the other hand, he receives, um, and this would have been like a common drink that the soldiers would bring with them to quench their thirst during the crucifixion because it was not uncommon for a crucifixion to sometimes last three to four days days. So they simply took what they had brought for their own refreshment and they lifted up to Jesus. But here's the part that really matters. The reason why Jesus says, I am thirsty, it's not for the sole purpose of quenching his thirst or easing his discomfort. The purpose behind Jesus getting a drink was so that he could wet his throat because in a moment, he is about to say the most important thing ever said by a human being in the history of the world. And no, that is not an exaggeration or parabolic in any way, shape, or form. So what is it that Jesus says? Let's read together. Verse 30. It said that when he received the drink, Jesus said, and when you say the next three words with me loudly and proudly, you ready? It is finished. One more time. It is finished. Last time, I promise. It is finished. And with that, we'll talk more about that in a moment. He bowed his head and gave up his what? His spirit. The word spirit there, it's not he gave up the Holy Spirit. It's that he gave up his, his human spirit. That in this moment, Jesus would give up his, his spirit and instantly he was then in the presence of the Father at his right hand, at least for three days because he he's got some business to attend to in a few days. But this is awesome because it shows us a picture of what happens to us in our lives. 
that we are spiritual beings and there will become a moment when we will breathe and those of us in Christ, when we breathe our last, our spirit will leave and instantaneously, within nanoseconds, we will be in the presence of Jesus and the Father in paradise. And this is what Jesus, he he shows us, is he dies on the cross, his spirit leaves, and he's like, YOLO, psych, YOLT. Three people got that joke. Because in Christ, you don't only live once. In fact, you don't only live twice. We come alive at birth, we come alive in Christ, and then we come alive in death, y'all. One of my favorites, uh, A.W. Tozer, said at my funeral, don't believe the lie the pastor tells you. I won't be dead. I will be more alive in that moment than I've ever been. Jesus, he gives up his spirit and he instantly, he goes to the Father. So here's what I want us to do as we prepare to close. I want you to get ready, get your elements out. In closing, guys, Jesus says the three most important words in human history. But if we're going to be factual, he actually only says one word. And it's the Greek word tetelestai. And I'm 50% sure, I don't know if this is real or not, This might actually be tattooed on Carson's arm, I noticed during worship. Yeah, okay, that's fun. We're so committed to creative elements here, we tattoo our points on our worship leaders. The Greek word is tetelestai, right? And it's a a robust word, it's a complicated word, but in its purest form, it simply means like paid in full. It's amazing how one word can change every aspect of your life. I think back to the year 2006 when Laura and I were engaged and I surprised her one morning, showed up her house about 3 a.m., flew her to Chicago and proposed to her in the lawn at Millennium Park. And the word yes would change every bit of my life. I was really relieved. I was 50-50 where she was gonna go. Said yes. I think of two, two years, fast forward, year 2008. While looking at a pregnancy test six months into our marriage and unexpectedly hearing the word positive would change every part of my life. I think of the year 2023 in the Super Bowl. Heard the the best word that I had heard all game. Holding. changed everything, man. One word can change everything in your life to tell us that. It is finished. If you really think about it, humanity has existed in three distinct moments. Moment number one is before it was finished. Moment number two, while it was being finished. I want you to take out the bread. I just want you to hold it in your hand for a moment. I want you to just think of your life, your sin, 
your regrets. Don't dwell here, but just for a moment, think about the people you've hurt and you've lied to. The lies you've told others, the lies you've told your, yourself. The compromises you've made. Just for a second, could we dwell on our sin and remember it? It's not recorded in the Gospel of John. But there's a phrase that Jesus makes. It confuses a lot of people. He says, Father, why have you forsaken me? My belief is that in that moment, the reason Jesus says that is because for the first time in his life, the Father will break the communion with Jesus on the cross and he lifts his presence away from him. The reason is, is because his father has to do the most difficult thing a father would have to do. It's because in that moment, he would then place all of humanity's sin on his son. Everything that you thought of represented by this bread would be placed on Jesus. Everything that you have done, everything that you will do today or do for the rest of your life. In that moment, he would become the most inhumane, grotesque, despicable creature. And he would take it on. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21 would describe it as God would make him, Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that through him, we might become the righteousness of God. That God would make Jesus sin so that he could make us righteous. There was a moment, a dark moment when it would be finished. It was being finished because it was placed upon Jesus. Let's take the bread together. I want you to take the juice. And then Jesus utters that phrase to tell us die. And I want us to understand that when Jesus says it is finished, it means all of the work, the task that God had given him to accomplish on the earth in that moment was now done. It was completed. It was fulfilled primarily to bear the weight and the penalty of humanity's sin. But guys, here's what that means. It is finished reminds us that through Christ, there is no penalty left to be paid that it has been paid in full, that there is no remaining balance, that everything that was ever needed to accomplish your salvation for all eternity was accomplished at Calvary on the cross in this moment. Everything that you will ever need. But yet for some of us, we still choose and attempt to pay our own bills, do we not? Imagine it this way. Imagine that you go to this really nice restaurant. You know the kind that you, you save up for on anniversaries and birthdays, and you're there with friends, and, and you go all out. Appetizers, and you, you, you spare no expense, course after course, and in the back of your mind, you're thinking, this is so good, but it's going to take me a month to pay this off. And out of nowhere, unexpectedly, your friend reaches over and pays your bill in full. You can't believe it. Hundreds upon hundreds of dollars that this burden, this financial obligation has been taken off of your plate. What a joy, what a gift, what a blessing. But then can you imagine in that moment walking up to the manager and saying, you know what, I know they paid for it, but I'd like to pay for the same meal again. 
what? Madness. And not only that, I would, I'd like to come back tomorrow and then pay for, again for the meal I ate today. And then I want to come back next week and pay again for the meal that's already been paid for. And then I'm gonna come back a year from now and just keep paying for something that has already been paid. This is what we do in our lives. That we offend and we belittle the beauty of Tetelestai because Christ paid it all. And because of our fear, our lack of faith, we attempt in vain to pay a bill that is already paid in full. And so for some of you this morning, you need to hear that you cannot subtract from it is finished. You can't take anything away from it. You can try to pay your own bill, but it will fail. The bill has been paid. There is nothing more you can possibly do. But not only can you not subtract from it, you can't add to it either. And this is the trick that the enemy plays on Christians who have been in the faith for a while. That not only they take salvation, they take grace, but then they want to add all these works on top of it. Believing that by doing all of this good stuff, they'll somehow be loved more. They'll be superior in God's eyes. Foolishness. It's paid in full. It's holistic. It's complete. Everything we have ever needed in this moment was accomplished on the cross. This would be the moment that you could go back to in human history that changes everything. The thousands of years of the Bible, all of the Jewish scripture of the Old Testament, everything in the gospels leading up to this moment, it is now finished. Everyone say finished. The old Levitical sacrificial system now finished. Everyone say finished because they have been given the sacrificial lamb. The satisfaction of God's justice finished. Everyone say finished. Your guilt your past, the power of Satan, sin, and death over your life. It's finished. It's done. It's over. And when Jesus would utter those words to tell us die, it wouldn't be the moan of defeat. It would be the victor's cry. That's a gift of victory. So do you, because I think I was talking about this with my friend Sai after first service and it kind of just light bulb went off. It's a faith issue. Do you have the faith to believe that it's finished? That's what it boils down to, isn't it? It's like, no, you could what I did was really stupid and really dumb. Okay, yeah. But do you have faith that it was finished? Do you have faith that it was already paid for? It doesn't justify it. It was the same sin that would put him on the cross. But do you have faith that it was paid for? It's a faith issue. And when I have faith, I can walk free. It's actually because my bill is paid, it doesn't justify me going out and doing whatever I want. Because I'm free, I'm gonna live as someone who's free. When I've been set free, I'm not gonna run back to the bondage of slavery. And so for, I think there's two groups for us before we take the juice together. For some of us, we need to have faith and believe in the power of Tetelestai, that it is finished. And we need to stop the foolishness of paying for bills that have already been paid. The only weapon the enemy has against you, you know what it is? Lies. That's all he can do. It's all he can do is distort truth and to lie. I don't even believe in Christ. He has the power to enslave you. You only can enslave yourself through lies. So live as someone who's free. 
That's group number one. Group number two, it's for those of you, he's actually pulling out a seat in the table. He's welcoming you to sit down to pay the bill. Do you have the faith to believe, A, that Jesus really was who he said he was, and B, that someone could see every part of you and love you enough to still invite you to the table? all the power, every, every debt, every bill, Jesus paid it. He paid it in full. And so there's now nothing I can possibly do to add or subtract from that. I've been forgiven. I've been set free. I've been given a new identity, a new heritage, a new purpose, a new joy. Because everything that was directed at me, the justice that I deserved, the cross that I deserved, that now I'm Barabbas. There was three that deserved to die and there were three that killed. So I, I get to walk the streets free. So Father, what do we do with that? And I pray that we would live as those who are free. That we would not believe lies, that we would reject them in Jesus' name. That we could begin to walk out our purpose and that we would invite as many people as possible to the table. Because there is a generous benefactor who's just out paying off bills. And he'll pay for theirs. If they'll have the faith to believe that they are worthy, not even worthy, but there's love given to them, forgiveness for them new beginning for them. So we thank you, Lord. I pray that we would walk in the joy and the hope that the power of my past is finished in Jesus' name. It has no authority over my life. That my deepest regrets they are finished. They have no authority over me. That my biggest mistakes, my greatest sin, finished in Jesus. Paid in full. So Father, may we be done paying bills and may we start living life to its fullest and walking out our purposes, our gifts, our passions, our story, and inviting others to the table. We thank you, Lord, for the power of Tetoasai. And the next time the enemy wants to lie to me, the next, next time the enemy wants to remind me of my past, I'll just remember my future, that I'm forgiven. Through Jesus, I have a purpose. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone said?